Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Life of the Mind Interdisciplinary Conversations with UC faculty. I'm Shima Wang, Dean at the University Library of UC. On behalf of the Life of the Mind Steering Committee and my co-chair, Cynthia Ries, here, I thank you for joining us today as we celebrate UC faculty research, scholarship, and creative output. Put. Before I introduce uh, our speaker, Professor Sarah Steezy Lai, I would like to take a moment to recognize the Life of the Mind Steering Committee who planned and organized today's event. In addition to Cynthia and myself, those members including Caleb Adler, Jenny Doctor, Jonathan Ayo, Helene Hart, Jenny McWiss, Melissa Loris, and Michael Shaw. For those of the members here, could you stand up, be recognized? We can thank you. <laughs> thank you, committee member. Life of the Mind is a semi-annual lecture series that features a distinguished UC faculty members presenting his or her works and expertise. After remarks, a panel of the UC faculty member will respond to and discuss the lecture from diverse perspectives and engage the audience in further discussions. We are so thrilled today to present you our Life of the Mind faculty presenter, Professor Sarah Stizzy Mai, Professor of the Education and Affiliate Faculty in Philosophy. As a philosopher of education, she explores the purpose and practice of education from the perspective of social and the political philosophy. She aims to uncover problems in education and envision better alternatives. Her work touches on issues of political agency, educating for democracy and equity in schools. She is the president-elect for the John Dewey Society, editor of Journal of Democracy Education, and the winner of the UC Excellence in Teaching Award. Today, her title for presentation is What's Next for America? Teaching Hope and Revive, Reviving Democracy. Please join me in welcome Professor Stislein. Thank you for coming. I'm going to start with a bit of a request for understanding today. I, um, the sweet, innocent six-year-old germ factory that I call my son Johnny brought home some nasty bug to me, and I have been coughing and sneezing, and I have my traveling pharmacy up here. You'll see tissues and tea, so hopefully bear with me today, and I'll make it through without too much coughing and sniffling to get in the way. Um, let me start with a few thank yous. Um, I want to thank the Life of the Mind Steering Committee again. Um, thank you for selecting me. Thank you to my colleague, Elizabeth Jean-Baptiste, uh, in the back for nominating me. Um, thanks to the support uh, from the UC Libraries, from the Faculty Senate, from the Office of the Senior Vice President and Provost. And thanks to Melissa Norris in the back for all that she has done to organize and publicize today's event. And thanks to President Neville Pinto. Um, you'll see that I'm building off of his Next Lives Here motto for UC strategic direction as a part of my talk today. It's a good time to be talking about hope in the United States. I'm on the heels of several deeply disturbing hate-based attacks within the past week. Um, as we're in the midst of a contentious election season, and as we deal with the continued fallout 
of transitioning from one presidential era to the next in both 2008 and 2016, marked by significant shifts in how our polarized population experiences both hope and despair. During the 2008 presidential campaign, Barack Obama had, as he called it, the audacity to hope. And although I had been a longtime Republican, um, I was in a new courtship with Democrats at the time, and I got kind of swept up in that idea of hope. And from our homes, from our couches, many of us happily endorsed Obama's hope campaign slogan. Um, some of us affirmed that message by buying those kind of iconic hope t-shirts, right, with his face and simply said hope at the bottom. Um, some of us took to aid in his campaign, others into implementing aspects of his vision for the country. And on Martin Luther King Day in 2009, so the day right before his inauguration, I was caught doing just that by a newspaper photographer, um, that's me in the big faux fur hood up here, um, responding to Obama's call for a day of service. And I took to those snow-covered streets. I'm holding a sign that says believe. I actually didn't create this sign, but someone handed it to me, but I realized it was significant later on. And then of course, uh, the guy beside me you see here wearing that Hope t-shirt. But within a few months of this Martin Luther King Day event, doubt set in and I took my seat back on the couch, naively content to believe that things were gonna get better. But at the end of Obama's presidency on the heels of a contentious election in 2016, many of us, especially those coming from the left who were supporting Obama, started to wonder, what happened to hope? While at the same time, some on the right, perhaps some of those in the picture here, perhaps some of my, um, my family who's here with us today, Ohio Midwest farming family, strongly Republican, many Trump supporters in my family, are also starting to ask, what happened to hope? Um, I'm, I'm seeing my father sitting up here toward the front, and he, uh, when I was telling about this project in the early stages, he said something along the lines of, I'm starting not to feel hopeful about anyone anymore. The problem is, is that the form of hope that we often boast during campaign seasons and election conversations doesn't involve sustained action. During the campaign, hope is pretty passive for most couch supporters, a person had hope, but didn't do anything beyond just casting a ballot or maybe donating a few dollars here and there to a campaign. <clears throat> I want to briefly start by taking stock of some of the current conditions that relate to hopelessness in America. And I want to focus here on hopelessness as it relates to democracy rather than in our personal lives where we do know that despair is growing. It's reflected in rising rates of suicide and opioid addiction and a whole host of uh, factors related to despair. Unfortunately, these are conditions where hope is struggling, where democracy may be in jeopardy and where the dominant form of hope that we do see is largely privatized. A recent study using the World Value Survey, this is something sent out to folks around the world to kind of assess how they're feeling about their political systems and about their day-to-day -day lives. The finding here that I'm going to quote from the board shows that citizens in America have become more cynical about the value of democracy as a political system, less hopeful that anything they do might influence public policy, and more willing to express support for authoritarian alternatives. Those citizens have become increasingly withdrawn from dem democratic participation, whether that be through formal institutions or alternatives in the public and civic sphere, so things like joining in movements or in protests. There are likely a lot of factors influencing that current state of affairs, but I want to hit on just a few here with you today. First, several of our recent political candidates have run on messages of hope and yet the visions evoked have often been, have failed to be fulfilled in reality, kind of crushing those heightened expectations of our citizens. In the cases of both Obama and Trump, some citizens placed their hope in the leader himself, invoking kind of a messianic figure that they believed in and counted on. Second, structural violence and inequality have wreaked havoc on hope. 
In some cases, it's made hope simply exhausting as we continue to tell marginalized citizens to just hang in there, never give up hope, keep trying at it, um, that they must have to keep working to earn a better life for themselves, in part through improving their own character, regardless of systems of inequity and justice that may be working against them. Third, citizenship in America has increasingly become centered on personal responsibility, on entrepreneurship, and private success. So we see historical accounts of rugged individualism, that founding kind of American spirit of pick yourself up by the bootstraps. That's combining with the teaching of grit. And this is the education professor in me here. You may not know that we actually now test children to see how gritty they are. This is now a goal of US education schools. So when you combine that rugged individualism with teaching for grit, those two together feed this expectation that one's got to fight to earn one's position, to earn one's goods in a competitive marketplace. This sort of environment lacks trust in others. It discourages collaborative effort. And often those who have not been successful in the past or don't see a viable avenue for being so in the future, they fatalistically accept those conditions. They become passive about countering or changing them. While others who have enough resources and perhaps enough power to be relatively comfortable with present life indulge in what I see of as a privilege, uh, the privilege of being cynical or apathetic. And some spread those kinds of ideas of hopelessness and jaded negativity through social media, you know, memes we see about the ineffectiveness of government, that kind of why bother mentality that we pass along to our friends in social media. Cynics then believing that their political efforts are useless, perhaps that everyone's just out for their own mere self-interest, they're left to look out just for themselves without a sense of responsibility to act on behalf of themselves or others. Now note here how cynicism functions as a distancing maneuver. It separates citizens from each other, from formal democratic institutions, and from civic organizations, where those visions of an improved future and the action to achieve it tend to occur. So finally, what's left of hope is largely privatized. So hope is kind of reduced to this mere drive to achieve one's own limited dreams, typically only through financial terms or economic goods. And when we see citizens rendered these just kind of isolated competitors fighting against each other for those limited dreams, they lose the ability to detect social problems and they lose the motivation to ameliorate them, especially if the effects on oneself or one's family are not immediate. So we are left with this so-called new complacent class. Folks who are content with the way things are, as long as they're not directly harmed and as long as they can stay surrounded by people and things that confirm their experience of the world. So we see this demonstrated in the rise of hyperpartisan confirmation bias, echo chambers. In other words, we turn to others like us to confirm our beliefs and our news sources. So altogether, these changes in citizens' lives and views, they debilitate individual citizens and democracy as a whole. They keep us from recognizing and solving social problems and from leading better lives together. So citizens tend to sit around waiting for reasons to hope, sometimes getting swept up in campaign rhetoric when election cycles come along, like I did rather than acknowledging that hope is generated through action as subjects working together. So can I hope and what should I hope for? These questions guide our pursuit of the good life and they're often shaped by our political and our educational experiences. We aren't born with ready-made hopes. Rather, we shape them through our interactions with others and with our growing sense of what's possible as we learn about our environment and experiment with changing it. Other people play an important role in that process, especially through institutions like schools, um, social arrangements like families, and political practices like democracy. 
Yet despite that, we often describe hope in individualist terms. We tend to talk about hope as if it were something that just lives within one person's beliefs or feelings. So for example, a lot of theologians link hope with the idea that there's an individual who has faith in a deity who's going to act on his or her behalf. Philosophers, we tend to see hope as this kind of narrow understanding of um, it's an individual's desire for an outcome who, that is uncertain. And then there's these folks called positive psychologists. They have this wonderful job of studying happiness and optimism and things like hope. And they see hope as describing an individual using their willpower and what they call their way power to achieve clear aims often in the distant future, so big overarching goals. This sort of individualist understanding of hope fails to encapsulate the full process of hoping and its potential impact on democracy. So my goal today is to explore what's next for America as I try to think about how we might revive our struggling democracy. I want to explain what hope is, why it matters to democracy, and how we can teach it to students. I'll start by offering a pragmatist account of hope, uh, one that's firmly rooted in the real circumstances of life, like the kinds of conditions that were contributing to hopelessness that I just mentioned. And I'll show how a pragmatist view of hope is not individualist, but rather is necessarily connected to other people and can be used to enrich our experiences, our experiences in democracy. <coughs> This is the kind of hope that I think can help us counter some of our current political struggles and social problems, all the while building a new democratic identity for us together. So I'm going to consider both how we hope and what we hope in democracy. Now, I realize American pragmatism is probably a philosophy that's unfamiliar to most of you in the room right now, and I want to try to lay out some of its key claims without getting bogged down in heavy jargon of the field. Believe me, all I have to do is say that I'm a philosopher, and some folks' eyes just like glaze over. So bear with me as I try to lay out some of this. If you've never heard of pragmatism, um, it's one of the few distinctly American traditions in philosophy. It started right here in the United States, and if such a thing as the American spirit exists, I think pragmatism captures it well. It's about facing difficult realities and responding with hard work and ingenuity and a vision of a better life ahead. I especially adopt the, philosopher, uh, the, the philosophy of pragmatist John Dewey, who was also a pioneer in innovative approaches to education. So you hear me talking about him a few times today. Now, pragmatism starts with the real, messy, muddy, complicated conditions of our world. This is not just like pie-in-the-sky idealism, okay? This is starting with where we are. And pragmatism begins <clears throat> by bringing together inquiry and habits and actions so that we can understand and change those environments to better align with our needs and our interests. I want to say a bit more about each of those parts. Let me start with inquiry. Hope often arises in the midst of despair, when we've lost our way, when we're struggling to know how to move forward. And when those moments occur, we should turn to the process of inquiry via the empirical method to help us explore those situations, understand what's going on, consider possible courses of action, and to test out various solutions or hypotheses. Yes, um, this is a form of inquiry that's carefully and closely aligned with the scientific method. Um, you might have seen around town, there's those big billboards up right now for UC Health that say, in science lives hope. I think they're on the right track. You'll hear me talking about the role of science and in inquiry again and again. It's empirical inquiry that helps us to understand and act upon and change our environment so that we're able to move forward out of those moments of despair, out of those challenging situations. Notably, this method combats that stagnation of fatalism, urging us instead to formulate and to try out solutions. Second part of pragmatism is growth. We grow when we apply what we've learned from that inquiry. We create new ways to smoothly move from one activity or experience in our life to the next. 
Now we tend to think of growth as kind of progression towards some specific outcome, like graduating from UC. But this way of thinking tends to place all of the emphasis on that final static terminus, rather than focusing on the process of growing as itself educative and worthwhile. So pragmatism's alternative view of growth doesn't neatly and linearly move toward that fixed goal. Instead, it describes trajectories that are much more complicated. As changes occur in one's environment, pragmatism asserts that people have to continually return to that inquiry, going back to develop new hypotheses about those situations, to revise their aims and their goals. So John Dewey works with what he calls ends in view. Uh, ends in view are relatively close and feasible goals that we hold, still difficult to achieve, but pretty close at hand, rather than those overarching, long-term, far-off goals and some distant final endpoint in the future. Those ends in view, they guide our decisions and our hypotheses along the way, they keep us resourceful and attuned to present circumstances and the opportunities they present so that we can move forward toward that desired alternative. So each one of those little ends in view that we fulfill, they sustain our hope by highlighting the meaningful headway that we're making and they direct our further actions. Now, of course, many people think of hope as goal-directed, future-oriented. While objects of hope may serve temporarily as ends in view for pragmatists, it's the practice of hoping that moves us forward through inquiry, through experimentation as we pursue that kind of complicated trajectory. It's what helps to unify our past, our present, and our future. So hope then isn't just this vision of a far off future, but rather it's a way of living in the present, in the moment, that's both informed by the past and some anticipation about what's to come. So as we try to explain what's next for America, by charting ends in view, we have to first address what is and what was in America. <coughs> now the third part of pragmatist account here is something called meliorism. Um, I was speaking with one of the respondents beforehand. She's like, I've never heard of this. I had to go look it up. So let me tell you about it because it's certainly at the heart of what a pragmatist view of hope is. Pragmatists recognize the difficulty of our present circumstances, those messy, muddy, complicated moments in which we live. Yet they approach them practically rather than idealistically, using thoughtful action and believing that circumstances can be improved. So, meliorism holds that there's significant evidence in our history to show that we can make things better through effort and especially through collective work together. So unlike simple optimists, those are folks who tend to think the situation's necessarily going to work out for the best, no matter what, things are gonna get better. Pragmatists believe that people have to make effort to contribute to better outcomes. Such efforts are rarely undertaken alone. Instead, they're tied to others who are working together to solve social problems. So this meliorism, it's not a belief in inevitable progress, like things are gonna get better, but rather it's a call to human action, especially in the midst of struggle and uncertainty. So I'm going to explain this picture. You're probably wondering what this is here. Um, this is on the rug of the Oval Office during Obama's presidency. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., certainly a champion, a practitioner of hope, was enshrined here um, using a phrase he actually borrowed from Theodore Parker, where he says, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Now importantly, given that a lot of hopes fell flat, under President Obama, that messianic kind of figure I was discussing, Martin Luther King doesn't stop at the ark. He says, human progress never rolls on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men. You hear meliorism there? You hear effort, work? We cannot wait until we have a clear picture of final future goals. Rather, we have to act now in intelligent ways and through inquiry to bring about better conditions. 
Now, admittedly, one might not be drawn to this sort of melioristic outlook, especially if one's life has been plagued with hardship. But such an outlook can be supported and nurtured with evidence. So professors, religious leaders, fellow citizens, we can chart that historical impact of human effort that has demonstrably improved the world revealing goodness and just action even in the midst of or following many atrocities of justice. Then the final part of this pragmatist notion of hope is about habits. When we're deep in despair, we're unsure how to proceed. We, we flounder and we may succumb to some bad tendencies in those moments, things that lack flexibility like cynicism and apathy things that keep our lives stagnant, that fail to keep up with the changing world around us. But rather than reconciling ourselves to such a state, pragmatism is offering us a way of life that can reorient us, redirect us in new action. Now a lot of folks, if I said the word habits, you tend to think of dull routines, things we repeat daily without much thought. <clears throat> Pragmatists get a kind of different understanding here. Um, they view habits as predispositions to act. They're energetic, they're active. Habits organize our perception of the world based on our past experiences, but they also help us develop new ideas so that we can try out and move ourselves forward. Habits are what give us that know-how to act in the world. So we employ scientific inquiry not just to change the world to meet our needs, but also to reshape our habits when problematic conditions or novel situations arise. And it's that intellectual aspect of habits that gives them meaning, that keeps them elastic and growing. And even though we tend to carry out our habits in like seemingly independent or individual ways, it's this process of inquiry and growth and the development of our habits that unites us with the affairs and the well-being of other people. So one of my key claims today is how I want to define hope. I want to say that hope as a set of pragmatist habits is most essentially a disposition toward possibility and change for the betterment of oneself and often others. Today, a lot of citizens tend to proclaim whether they do or do not have hope, as though it's just an object that's possessed, often passively, you either hold it or lose it. Pragmatist habits of hope, however, are better understood as a verb, hope being an ongoing activity, an action. Pragmatist hope is a way of being that overcomes that paralysis of pessimism by bringing together proclivities and intelligent reflection to motivate one to act. And it also gives us a structure to sustain us as we do so. So hope is a way of projecting ourselves forward toward a better future, positioning us toward action. And hope helps us envision what that future looks like. <clears throat> ensuring that arises practically out of our current conditions and our knowledge of the past. Yet we move beyond those conditions through assessing possibilities, determining what do we desire, and imagining how we might rearrange our circumstances to achieve new and better conditions, to figure out what's next. So we use our imagination to construct those creative solutions and to envision using our agency to impact the world and change our circumstances. So you hear imagination and courage and agency all working hand in hand. Such an emphasis on agency and action suggests that we shouldn't just be standing idly by as we see a lot of our citizens doing today in the face of significant social problems. Nor should we throw up our hands in the air in resignation, you know, asserting, oh, we've lost hope. For hope is within us, and it's realized in our actions. It's not something that we hold or claim, but rather something we're in the practice of doing. It may not be in our hands, but it's on our shoulders. I want to be careful here because I don't want to suggest that we bear this kind of weighty culpability when we fall short or if we find ourselves exhausted by our best efforts at hoping. Because you have to remember, pragmatist hope is a collective call to work and action. Now there's this 
interesting group of folks living in Central America, kind of an off the grid group, if you will, where their entire culture is based around a political notion of hope. And an anthropologist named Leah Harrow went in to study this group, and when she came back out, this was the summary of her findings, and she shares some words directly from the group, and I want to share them with you. She says, hope is tended and increased in dialogue and receptive listening. Our hope grows and we become better because we know how to listen. The political dimension of insurgent hope, of creating a different future, requires the work of listening and speaking with others to find pockets of light and possibility that would be invisible without the advantage of multiple distinct perspectives. So hoping engages in this rather open-minded listening and collaboration. It brings people together rather than distances them like cynicism does. Hoping moves us beyond ourselves, connecting us not just to other people, but to the what was and to the not yet. Pragmatist hope then relies on trust. Trust in each other, trust in the ability of people to positively impact the world. Trust is struggling right now. As is my coughing voice, bear with me. <laughs> Trust is struggling in a neoliberal economy where we're taught that we have to compete with others to meet our needs. But what pragmatist hope demonstrates for us is at best a spirit of togetherness, a, a we of political life, and at minimum an acknowledgement of our necessary connections, relationships with others, that often achieving our own well-being is dependent upon fruitful interactions with others. So when we see the limitations of our own agency, when we admit where our actions stop or our efforts end, we're ushered into trusting others to take up the, the cause from there, to help us, to step in, to work together. Hoping together can help people build trust, to build commitment to each other. It's this forming of the we, this mutual care through hoping together that can help reaffirm the value of democracy, of shared political life, of freedom, all in the face of rising support for autocratic rulers today. So whereas our contemporary democracy is plagued by apathy about social problems, distrust of the motives of others, civic disengagement, pragmatist hope ushers us into that fray of those problems. It goads us to trust others and to take action alongside of them. Pragmatist hope shifts one's identity from just being a self-serving individual to belonging to a collective we. Such an identity enables citizens to better detect social problems and to recognize their mutual stake in them rather than just passively or cynically sitting by. Hope is not all about happiness, though. If we look outside right now, we see a lot of upset people taking to the streets around America, protesting and speaking out, disagreeing with the world they see around them. This is a sign that democracy is alive, but I think it could be improved if we better connected political dissent and hope. Now, perhaps counterintuitively, Hope can lead to dissent, because when we focused on that improved future that we desire, that better future ahead, we often find ourselves pretty dissatisfied, pretty frustrated with how things are in the present. But that discontent can be used proactively as democratic dissent. So when you have that sort of dissent, you're not just expressing your own dissatisfaction with the current state of affairs, but you're helping others to see the problems, kind of consciousness raising, if you will. <clears throat> then you're putting forward solutions to be discussed and tested. That sort of discontent becomes an important part of cultural criticism, of critique, and of inquiry geared toward improved social living. So unlike cynics, cynics are really good at complaining, but not putting forward any alternative instead. Dissent mobilizes action and it engages democracy to imagine and work toward a better future with knowledge of the past and previous visions that have been fulfilled. 
So turning to an authoritarian strong man, maybe something we resort to when we don't feel personally effective in achieving the world we want. Yet it's another way that we resign our agency, that we turn over our power to someone else. Instead, dissent is a way to take the struggles and frustrations of our citizens seriously and to give citizens agency in addressing them. So dissent enables those struggling citizens to name problems in the world, to call for collective work, and to engage in action rather than just resigning oneself to the negativity and the paralysis of despair. So through hoping together, we, we build our resolve. We bolster our courage to change and improve the world. And when we hope alongside others, we're buoyed when we face disappointment and obstacles and failure. Now, some folks would say that American democracy requires shared content to work. So we all need to have a certain level of patriotism, for example, or commitment to justice in order for democracy to work. I'm arguing it's this practice of shared hoping that binds us together. That shared hoping adapts to our changing environment, allowing us to affirm and amend our American ideals along the way. So hope matters to democracy because shared hoping and in the content of that hoping ties communities together. Hoping with others for the same goals entails a joint commitment that gives our connection substance and direction. Inviting others to engage in the imaginative parts of hope can help break down some of the walls between citizens that we see in America today. Part of the sort of polarization that we're seeing stems from stereotypes that we hold of folks across the political aisle, if you will. So perhaps that um, common ones, Republicans are uneducated and racist. Democrats are elitist and out of touch. When we imagine and problem solve with others across party lines, we have firsthand experiences that are going to confront those stereotypes with examples of intelligence and care and creativity and resourcefulness and more. And when we do this sort of work together and our focus is on our shared fate in the future, we're pushed to see that humanity and the value of those we may disagree with politically. Those shared conditions, that shared fate, can give rise to shared objects of hoping, so the what we hope for. Those shared ends could be things like the, the principles of democracy, so um, justice and equality. They could be physical things like public parks or public schools. They can be ways of life that support and engage democracy, so things like cooperation and deliberation. They might be values having respect for persons. They could be practices like listening. Things that have proven useful within our inquiry in the past to help us face challenging situations. But the point here is that citizens work together to determine and revise those objects of hope. And when the shared hopes arise from people, public, so groups of people, arise to solve those current social problems, to achieve common goods together. Those publics, they talk about that shared fate. They often form organizations or movements, societies, groups. And as they do, they seek out a wide array of perspectives on the issue at hand. Within that group, then, they, they name their struggles, they chart paths to improvement, sometimes through developing shared content for hoping, those, that what we hope for. And it's these kinds of activities that help to build a sense of belonging, of mutual concern that counters that sort of individualism, that self-interested behavior, and the distancing of cynicism that we frequently see today. Now, from a pragmatist perspective, our identities are based in our habits. A pragmatist understanding of hope urges us to see hope as not merely instrumental toward achieving something else, but rather constitutive of our identities now. Now, of course, our identities influence how we interpret the past and our future. 
and in acting habits of hope may impact how we both understand ourselves and how we interpret our part in democracy and how we act on both of those things. So when we form a vision for the future, we come to engage in behaviors aligned with that future, thereby shaping ourselves, shaping our identities. So hope then just isn't kind of like perpetually held off to some far off point in the future. It's a value in the moment. So this pragmatist view of hope composes us now rather than just moving us towards something else. Now, culture is something that we tend to think of in the past. So it gets uh, memorialized in traditions and statues and documents. But culture is also about the future that we hope for and the shared identity that results from being a part of that vision and its formation. So one of the primary ways that we convey our vision of the future and thereby build culture and identity is through storytelling. Creating a hope narrative that sustains us and unites us. And I'll say more about that in a moment. <clears throat> Here's some good news. One of the best parts about habits is that they can be cultivated, nurtured, learned, developed. Hope is something we can both do and teach here at UC. So I want to close today by describing some of the ways that we can teach habits of hope across the educational spectrum. So from like preschoolers to postgraduate students. <coughs> to start, we already know that discourse and inquiry approaches enhance student learning. But such practices also simultaneously support teaching for pragmatist hope because they embrace that joint consideration of problems, of real problems in the world, and they allow students to come up with potential solutions and to try them out. That's the important part that we often leave out of our classes. Not just come up with the ideas, but to actually try them out, to test them. Now, a pragmatist classroom is going to start with real present social problems. So perhaps in America Day, this might mean a history classroom that tries to decide how are we going to handle that Confederate monument on campus or in our local community. Or a gender studies course trying to determine an appropriate response to propose new federal uh, ways of defining gender and thereby protections against gender and discrimination in binary terms. Professors, teachers can actively support students through the problem solving process as a means of developing their own capacities toward hopeful living. So we aren't just teaching how to solve one particular problem. We are apprenticing them into practices, into habits around how to define problems, how to come up with solutions, and how to determine markers of success. Notice that in those two examples I just used, so the Confederate monuments and gender identification, some students in a classroom are going to be clearly impacted by those issues. <clears throat> while others might not see them as significant or worrisome at all. Some students may have legitimate reasons to support those ideas, to contest those ideas, while others will not. That's why it's important that we spend time in class to discuss what makes an issue worthy of consideration or action, and why we need extended discussion of how an issue may adversely impact some populations who may not be even in our classrooms. So to dialogue effectively about those social problems, students have to learn how to explain their ideas using careful language, using argumentation to justify their reasoning both orally and in writing. But they also have to learn how to listen, both to understand the speaker, to probe the logic of the ideas offered, and at times to be sympathetic or empathetic to what they're hearing. In a country where distrust of others is high, the development and assessment of trust may be the work of teachers. Folks who are going to affirm for growing citizens the worthwhileness of trust, at the same time kind of scaffolding the hoping of students and their sense of self as capable agents. And I'm reminded here of psychologist Alfred Bandura who writes about self-efficacy. And his studies show that those who are supported in believing that they're able to achieve a desired outcome are more likely to persist in pursuing it. 
So if teachers can demonstrate the impact of a student's effort to those students, they're more likely to produce future citizens who recognize their own agency and engage in civic action. Teachers and professors can cultivate critical thinking with a spirit of criticality. Where critical thinking is not just like deep thinking, hard thinking, long thinking. Some of the problematic ways in which I hear my own students refer to critical thinking. Critical thinking is about criticality, where we're interrogating power structures, we're identifying injustice, we're asserting principles of democracy that enable citizens to flourish. So importantly, teaching for hope empowers students with habits and methods to critically question how the world works and why some problems even seem inevitable or unalterable. Thinkers who embrace those notions of criticality against the status quo work together toward greater understanding of the complex systems within which we operate. And here's where imagination comes in. Students with those sorts of competencies use their creative imagination to project a world quite different at times from the one in which we presently exist. They shape what's next. Students have to be empowered to develop feasible, intelligent plans of action and then to carry them out. So that they have to see not only the professor though, but also their peers as resources for defining and solving problems. So such an environment kind of creates a space for students to see themselves as active agents and to grow their disposition toward possibility as opposed to apathy or defeat. To support those students and their capacities to envision a different reality, one which they've never experienced, um, professors need to tap into the rich history of figures who have made a difference. Importantly, students need to access <coughs> stories that haven't just been sanitized for happy endings, but rather include real accounts of struggle. How hopers struggled with making decisions in the moment, especially when um, they had to wrestle with potential negative impacts on their families, their loved ones. We need to engage students with the turmoil they endured. So I'm thinking of folks here like Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, Nelson Mandela, folks we tend to describe of from this kind of after hindsight's 2020, we talk about all the happiness, all the great things they did. Um, my, my own son over the weekend was reading this children's biography of Martin Luther King, and he's like, Mom, you know, Martin Luther King won the Nobel Prize. And I said, you know, Johnny, do you know that when he found out he won the Nobel Prize, he was actually in the hospital? He was so sick and so exhausted and feeling so down about the current state of affairs, he was checked into the hospital, struggling, suffering. We don't tell that story in our autobiographies, in our textbooks, but that's the sort of struggle that those who are becoming hopers need to know. How did he get through that? What was his response when he heard about the Nobel Prize in that moment of suffering and struggle? But doing history involves critique critiquing the events that have led to our current values and ways of life, including our current struggles with despair and apathy. But such critique, it's not just the purview of the professor as you know, sage on the stage, but rather it should be practiced by the students themselves. But to do so, you can't do critique without historical understanding. You have to know about facts and events in order to make good assessments about the life you envision today and in the future. So in other words, you have to know history in order to answer what ought I hope or what's next for America. Shifting a bit here, I want to hit creative writing and other related humanities courses that help to develop student voice. They entail um, cultivating a student's sense of self-expression so that they're able to put forward their experience of the world, to lay claim to it, to integrate themselves into communities or stakeholders. One of the primary ways that we convey our vision of the future is through storytelling. Stories can help us out of the ruts that we face because they give us accounts of how problems can be solved, of how life can be better. They're kind of a check on that apathy that we see today. 
Stories can move us from passivity to participation in democracy. They show us both examples of how to take action and why it's worthwhile to do so. And stories can depict objects of hope. What should we hope for? But storytelling is not just about telling. And sometimes I really want to remind politicians of this, like during election seasons. Storytelling is also about listening to the needs and to the experiences of others so that we can reshape and improve our vision for the future, an informed vision for the future. So I want to close out today. Um, a lot of this has been kind of <clears throat> vague discussions of how to educate for hope, and I want to give you one concrete example of something that I do within my own classes, my own teaching here at UC. So as an education professor, I teach an undergraduate course called Save Our Schools, it's an education policy course that gets into all of the messy um, education reform movements you might hear about in the news today. So charter schools, merit pay for teachers, vouchers for private schools. And I talk with students about what are we going to do to alleviate inequality, injustice, underfunding, et cetera, in our schools. Each time we meet, uh, we start with a question that I've borrowed from one of my colleagues at Tufts University. We say, what should we do? This is a question that engages that pragmatist spirit of hope as collective orientation toward action and possibility. So from the start of the course, I get students out in the community and I put them in the role of listener. So they're assigned to do an interview with practicing teachers and administrators to find out what's going well in our schools, what's not, what's been tried, what should we try. And then the students integrate themselves into the community. So they partner with local nonprofits who are addressing an array of education related issues. So everything from homelessness to providing school supplies to after school arts enrichment um, programs. They're working across party lines, across racial lines, across economic lines, and pushing themselves to gather competing perspectives as they construct a proposal for how are we going to address and solve a particular area of education struggle. And then back in the classroom, I'm arming them. I'm arming them with historical understanding of how do we get to this struggle today. I'm giving them data to interpret the current situation. And I'm explaining pathways for how we address problems within a democracy. How, how do you change something within democracy? And then I'm just guiding them through that process of inquiry and problem solving. Next, they've got an assignment. They've got to write a letter to the editor. <clears throat> People have been doing that for years. Why does that matter? This is where students are learning to hone their skills of argumentation, of dissent, and of storytelling. This is how we start to get others to join us in our efforts, to make a case for why our approach to solving this problem in schools is better than some other. And then finally, uh, toward the end of our class, they present their best ideas for change to a panel of state legislators that I invite here to campus who listen to each of the students present their ideas, their specific hopes for the future, if you will. And they talk about how are we gonna implement those ideas? What policy making needs to take place? And I'm proud to say that those proposals my students have made have directly impacted Ohio law and Ohio school practices. So my UC students walk away ready to contribute to civic and political action and to work with a whole host of different populations to solve Ohio's K-12 problems. Across the curriculum, we should be developing both civic and political life, where civic life entails this kind of learning to participate in community through volunteer work and being tolerant of other viewpoints and a whole host of things. And political life entails learning to use power through voting, through movement building, and more. Civic life helps one become a part of society and thereby fights against that current trend toward apathy and cynicism, and political life provides the tools to leverage power so that we can change society to meet our needs. And, and of course, that then fights against those feelings of ineffectiveness and disengagement from democracy. So here's my conclusion. I think that pragmatist hope 
alleviate some of the problems we're currently facing in American democracy. It's, it's richly social and political, unlike some of those more individualist accounts offered by other understandings of hope. And insofar as habits of hope can be cultivated and taught and nurtured through our schools and informally through our families, our civic organizations, our religious institutions, they offer us a pathway out of current problems that is itself sustainable and deeply hopeful. I'll leave you with that. grant and what that means is that anyone who wants this book can get it for free. It's going to be published by Oxford University Press but you will be able to download it online. Um, I'm timing it to come out as the presidential election takes off in the 2019 year so hopefully you can start some community conversations about hope and about re-envisioning a better political life across our boundaries. Thank you. Thank you so much Sarah for a really compelling presentation. It was a, I thought, a very provocative balance between the concern and the struggles that you were talking about and, of course, hope through imagination and, as you said, courage and agency. It reminds me very much of um, just a couple weeks ago, there was a Warren Bennis lecture. Um, it was a leadership presentation here at UC, Warren Bennis was uh, the president of the university here through the 70s and helped move the college into a state university. Um, he had many uh, folks who admired him and his leadership abilities. Two of them were there that day. It was David Gergen, a political advisor to many presidents, and Doris Kearns Goodwin, biographer of many um, famous leaders of this country. And it reminded me, you reminded me of them when they were talking about what this country needs and especially what education needs and what the humanities in the university can bring to their students. And so one of the things that Doris Kearns Goodwin said was what we need is more great literature and they were talking about the power of storytelling and who we need are more poets. Um, and I think that captures that idea of the imagination the imagination that leads to courage and agency. So I think it's a very nice synergy that, that you bring um, on the heels of that lecture. And I know that our panelists and our audience are going to want to engage in this really thought-provoking topic and very current, of course. Um, I'm Cynthia Riss. I, I think I was introduced earlier, but just to remind you, I'm chair of the university faculty. And as Dean Wang said in his opening remarks, we have invited our three additional faculty members to respond to Professor Stitzlein's presentation and to engage us in further discussion. Life of the Mind is meant to do that, to provoke an open exchange of ideas. So I really much appreciate the opportunity to facilitate the discussion of ideas that I anticipate with our panelists and then with the audience in your questions and comments. So let me begin by introducing the three panelists. Please join me in welcoming Wendy Calloway, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice, UC Blue Ash College, Whitney Gaskins, Assistant Dean and Assistant Professor, Center for Inclusive Excellence and Community Engagement in the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and Antonio Islas Munoz, Assistant Professor of Practice, Head of Transportation Design, in the College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. To begin the discussion, Professor Calloway will provide a brief response to Professor Stitzlein's talk. She will be followed by Professors Gaskins and Islas Munoz. After their responses, I will open the floor for discussion and questions from the audience and between the speakers. So panelists, please keep your initial response to five minutes maximum so that we may have time for discussion and audience questions. Professor Calloway. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate the committee's invitation um, to be here today and to Sarah for the work that you've done. Thank you for sharing 
your um, thoughts and research. Um, your talk really resonated with me. I am um, an assistant professor of criminal justice, but I'm also an, a practicing attorney. And I practice in the area of criminal defense work. And so I expect I was invited to this panel, um, at least in part to give a legal perspective on um, the idea of teaching hope and hopeful pragmatist hope. Um, and when I started to think about these topics, I could not divorce myself from the recent news. Um, I watched the recent um, Senate hearings on the elevation of Judge Kavanaugh from the DC Circuit to the Supreme Court for many days and watched my legal colleagues and the legal community um, react with despair and horror is the best way I can describe it, um, that the committee was considering putting this person on the highest court in the land. And I am connected with a strong community of other legal educators and litigators and um, criminal justice reformers. And so this conversation started to emerge about, you know, this is the end of democracy. We have lost the only swing vote on the Supreme Court when Anthony Kennedy retired. People saw him as sort of the bulwark against, um, I guess, an onslaught of oppressive uh, litigation, oppressive political policies and legislation that there was not going to be a wall anymore to protect the people. Anthony Kennedy for a long time had been considered this sort of moderate that would go back and forth between the conservative wing of the court and the liberal wing of the court. And so when uh, he decided to retire and, and Kavanaugh got the spot, uh, there was a lot of discussion about this sort of being the end. And I started to think about that in the context of uh, the information that Sarah has given us. And I started to do a little bit of research on that. And it turns out that the hype about Kennedy being this, this bastion of liberalism or some protector of, of civil rights is not really well earned. <laughs> um, and then I started to look at the court in general and to say, is the court really the place where we should be putting our hope? Because as lawyers, that's what we do. Um, especially if you're a criminal defense attorney or a civil litigator, you look to the court to hold the line. The court is supposed to be the one that protects the voice of the minority against the tyranny of the majority. And so as someone who studies law, this is where we put our hope. But I started to look at the court decisions um, over our history and saw that uh, our hope has been misplaced. So we have just sort of taken a back seat and said, you know, we can do our litigation and put our cases on, but the court will save us. Um, and you can see that also in the popular culture today. Um, if, you, if I don't know if you all pay attention to what's going on in the legal world, but uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been elevated to a rock star superhero. Now she's the Messiah that's going to save us. We can all be okay as long as Ruth Bader Ginsburg stays with us on the court. Uh, and so we've just kind of shifted our, our reliance on Kennedy to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But when you look at the court as an institution, it really hasn't done a great job of protecting us. What I saw is the court follows. <laughs> the court has not led. Um, and I just jotted down a few decisions from Dred Scott, where, you know, basically, if you're African American, you can't be a citizen. Plessy versus Ferguson, which stamped separate but equal as being okay. Um, Bush versus Gore, which basically said we can't have a democracy. <laughs> Citizens United, which has put uh, our democracy in the hands of the rich and the powerful. The Korematsu decision, which okayed Japanese internment. Uh, and there's others. It can go on and on here talking about these cases. Um, but what you start to see is a situation where the court has not <laughs> um, been the place where we should put all of our hopes. And so enter the research that Sarah has done and my thoughts about that saying, um, what kept ringing in my ears when I was reading her paper is, I think it was a book by Alice Walker, I'm not sure, but the title was, We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For. Yeah. And so yeah. this idea that we can't, as lawyers or as citizens, sit back and think, okay, well, the court's got this, uh, because it doesn't. <laughs> and um, as long as it's going to be on the arm of the political actors, we are going to have to take responsibility for this. Um, and it's uh, just so interesting, the timing of this. Sandra Day O'Connor was the first woman who was put on the Supreme Court, and she just came out with this paper basically saying how we all have a responsibility to teach 
um, students and children and young people coming up today about their responsibility as citizens and their responsibility of being part of a democracy. And I don't think that's talked about enough. Um, well, I was listening to the talk today. I jotted down a note um, that said, so what? Question mark. I guess she's talking, so what? And I had to scratch it out because she did such a good job of saying the so what. <laughs> At the end of my lectures, I always put on the slide, so what? Like, I've given, given you all this information, so what? And so I try to say, here's how you can use that information. But I came away from this talk feeling very inspired as an educator that I can do something about this. So the idea that you can teach hope um, really resonated with me and I hope to be able to convey this to my lawyer friends as well we have to do more than just hope that the courts will save us and so from a legal perspective I feel that um, the future of the legal profession lines up really well with what um, you're saying if only we can inspire it becomes more than aspirational but we can inspire people to actually live hope as a verb. So I have been asked to keep my remarks to five minutes, so reluctantly I'll pass the microphone. <laughs> well, thank you um, also for the invitation to be here. My name is Whitney Gaskins, and I am an assistant professor and assistant dean of the College of Engineering. I actually was shocked I was asked because I am an engineer, and as I started reading, I was like, well, maybe this is why I was invited. So obviously a black woman um, and my experiences in America are very interesting so we'll leave it at that um, but I, I say that because as I read the paper all I could think was well yeah duh um, and not just because it seems so common sense but because of my upbringing rooted in what is not described in this paper but the black church so something that's not talked about um, necessarily was about the fact that there are some that call on to a higher power and their hope is rooted that some Lord or Savior or deity will come and save you but in the black church that is spun very differently it is not about that the Lord and Savior is going to come save you but that he gave us the resources on earth to do so and that we will indeed help ourselves so very pragmatic in the faith, which is something that's not heavily discussed. One, it might be the hidden gem, not so hidden anymore, hashtag trust black women, if you haven't um, read that. But in the wake of politics, when you understand how the election of Doug Jones, how that turned out, um, understanding from uh, civil rights, voting rights, understanding educational programs, daycares, hospitals started um, in the black community from black churches, We've had that very pragmatic view on how can we help each other to a point where you see more black people, women and men in general, voting outside of their best interest to help the collective body have access to resources and things, um, even when it would negatively infect, impact them. So I say that to say like I was really shocked that it's something that would be considered not necessarily new, but hey, this is how we can go about hope because I think through 400 years of oppression, this is the story that we are told. This is what is passed down line by line by our elders. And yeah, it's interesting that it's rooted in church. So I, I, thought, I found that to be very interesting, but I also found that it might be one of those times where our church opens our doors to more people so that they too can understand the process in which we go to help solve our collective problems. So as much as we help each other and we try to do the collective good for our black community, it might be time that others really do take on that hashtag, trust black women, and understand what it would take for you to do this as a collective body of America. I think more trust about those who have had the disappointment that people may have felt when the election happened. Sadly, I don't think a lot of us were surprised. We were truly disappointed and heartbroken, um, but I think that given the, the hate crimes that happened this week, um, the, the disappointment of elections and the things that are said, the rhetoric that is now acceptable, that, we, um, that is truly hurtful, it's interesting because it's not new. Um, and we are acting as if it is new, but it isn't. And I think that I, that perpetual letdown and that trauma, to be honest, is something that we've learned to deal with our entire lives. And so I think it's time for others to understand what our experience in America has been. When I say our, I mean minorities in America.
William, thank you so much for, <clears throat> for the invitation and um, thank you for your talk. I, I'm going to start first by saying that um, I come from Mexico, so I've been in a country where for 70 years we had what was called the perfect dictatorship. Uh, one political party that would uh, cheat on elections every six years. And then, like, there was change in power and stuff like that. But still, when I saw the title of your paper, Sarah, I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. Hoping and democracy <laughs> is not something that in Latin America goes really well together. And I it made me think because when I started reading the paper, I really found uh, those points that resonated with what I thought I wasn't going to find in your paper, I found. And that was the, the point of action. And uh, I want to start by addressing, although I, my main contribution is going to be about technology, but that part of the complacent class, that the perpetual letdown is, is dangerous and it makes societies dormant. Uh, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, Brazil had a big election and they yielded to this. And uh, I was thinking that when I realized that, we also had a big election recently in Mexico, and it was fundamentally different because the society in Mexico was active for the first time in a long, long time. So part of this was facilitated by technology, and I don't know if that uh, choice that we made in Mexico is going to be good or not, but social media had the ability to reach out to people and make them move. Now, we still have the same problems with um, fake content being uh, moved and people are waking up and starting different things. But I think that at least it's exposing people to different ways of thinking and making them question things. So that's really good. Uh, we're about to go into a major revolution which is going to change the way we live today. We are um, on the verge of what uh, Jeremy Rifkin calls the third industrial revolution, other uh, economists call it the fourth. But let's say, to put it in perspective, the level of change from the pre-industrial society to a post-industrial society, or pre-oil and cars to post-oil and cars, we're on the verge of one of those happening again by the combination of autonomous mobility, renewable energies, uh, the shared economy and the internet of things, amongst other factors. And this could be used to bring out a better future, like you described, um, or an endowment society could be used to serve private interests that will give us a consequence, a future that is not um, the one we want. So whether we let hope or despair lead our decisions from now on is going to be crucial. We have a world where um, we're going to have autonomous vehicles roaming on the streets. And when we realize that a great part of the economy in the United States is from people working on driving cars, we have to decide what that shape is going to be. If we let the corporate interest do it, a lot of people are going to be left without a job. Uh, same thing, connectivity, internet of things, all that big data that all these new sensors and cities uh, products, uh, vehicles are going to start producing can either be used for the uh, greater good or be used for other things. And we just had uh, this internet neutrality things be taken away, um, which is part of the despair, I think, that uh, people have not been ready to, to fight for these things because they're comfortable in, in their lives. We have the shared economy as well that is changing the concept of the need to own something, the need to be this person that's defined by the objects that you have. So I'm hoping that this concept will also transcend into a shared hope uh, where I, I love what you've mentioned about uh, hope is not about your personal goals and it's about transforming the them to the we and that has to do with being exposed to otherness and seeing that it's not a bad uh, thing. And I think technology can, uh, can bring that to us. Uh, just to close, um, the way that we can use hope and action to change it, uh, me coming from design, has to be with the acceptance that the change is going to bring good and bad things and for iterative uh, improvement, uh, we can achieve this and hopefully we are smart enough to use technology to our advantage. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn things over to the audience, but, but it's interesting. One of the things that I'm observing in your responses is the tension between what you were talking about, the personal and the collective. Um, you know, Wendy started with talking about her frustration during the election, and yet um, you bled into the legal community working together. Whitney, you talked about your, your background as an African-American woman, and yet you started talking about the collective body of the church and, and how they support each other. And Antonio, you were talking about your life, your personal feelings of you know, in your background in Mexico. And then you, you moved into that disciplinary body that you belong to um, that will hopefully lead us to some promising features for technology. So I, I think it's the idea of the, this, I think, resonates with a lot of us personally. And so whether your questions are personal or from a disciplinary standpoint or you know, the, the collective body and what we should do, I think it's just it's something that um, to, the, to move from one to the other is, is actually part of the challenge of what you're talking about, which I think is, is really compelling. And Sarah, if you'd like to get up, I'll, I'll drag your chair over here. <laughs> This is the high-tech way of getting it. Sarah, <laughs> come on over here. I know I might just um, use me for just a second. <coughs> this pops up while I can. So I'd like to open up um, questions to the floor. So, so who would like to start us out with either a question or a comment, whatever you would like to um, address to any one of the panelists or to Sarah? I kind of put them on the spot. They kind of easy up here. <laughs> Yes, sir. My question is for Sarah. Um, there, there was a point that I, I thought I would at least give you the opportunity to expand on. And that was the idea that we could somehow bridge political divides in this country through a shared hope in things like justice and other, other values. Um, I wonder, though, it, it, am I firmly in the camp of the cynics then <laughs> if I don't automatically think both sides have those same ideals in mind? and that something like tribalism and simply winning has crowded out those other values that we might find in, say, the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. Can okay, you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jay Arns. I, uh, I teach in the Classics Department at Xavier. Uh, so. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah, welcome to UC. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Um, how shall I start? So I'm sitting here wearing rose-colored glasses, literally, today. Um, that's a, a, a joke that some of my friends like to point out for me, that I tend to see things in the best possible light. And perhaps, you know, you're kind of like me back to reality, that the values may be drastically different from one of these communities to the other. But I think when we focus less on hoping around a particular value, like tribalism or nationalism or equity or justice, and more around social problems, so problems that are impacting us. I think when it's hoping around something we're struggling with together, so safety or clean air and clean water, things that expand across different groups and different values, that when you are engaged together in addressing those social problems that sometimes you start to break down those walls that might be values-based so that you actually start to reshape the values. You have conversations about, you know, maybe having this kind of tribalism is not helping us. Maybe it's hurting us in some way or vice versa. By that experience of problem solving together around a real shared social issue. Does that make sense? It certainly does. It seems like maybe that would be more effective uh, the, the more local you could be. Yeah. It's hard for us to feel the impact of those national problems Definitely. sometimes. Yeah. Can I offer a practical sure. example? So um, I'm not by any means a history buff, but I do love to read random books. And one of the, one of those that I just read, well, I went to a lecture at the Freedom Center, and the speaker talked about the Rainbow Coalition way before Jesse Jackson co-opted it. Um, so the Rainbow Coalition would be a perfect example of following exactly the methodology that Sarah lectured about today, where white nationalists, Black Panthers, and a Puerto Rican, Latin American group 
got together because their value systems were indeed the same. Even though they did not see eye to eye on everything, everyone wanted better education for their children. They wanted to have resourcing to get food. They wanted better systems um, when in, in regards to police and housing. And they came together, can you imagine, um, Black Panthers, white nationalists on the same stage, preaching and talking to c their communities about why they should work together to bring about change. It was that Rainbow Coalition, which was in Chicago, so very local, that in Chicago that really could bring about change in that city that actually did start to spread in different pockets, that chapters in different cities across the United States developed their own Rainbow Coalitions and actually brought about change. Now things happen when people start infiltrating that don't have the same value systems to help break those groups apart. But they are a recent example because we can still actually point to the people that are still living. We can still point to them to say that they were able to do exactly that. Put any personal and individual bias aside and work as a collective unit to bring about change. And they did an amazing job. And it's not really a story that we tell very well, which would also have helped keep it going if we would if it wasn't so so um, controversial to talk about the, the, the issues, because not everybody wants to be part of a collective movement, but it is possible. That's a great point about the importance of keeping those sorts of stories alive, stories that a lot of folks don't know. And then we're, we keep coming back to how, how could that work? What would that look like? And we have real examples of folks who've done this, but we have to continue to tell those stories and to seek them out. That's our responsibility on the other side. Someone else, yes. Uh, so this is uh, a little bit of a story for the, uh, what, we, what we just experienced this past week with the terrorist attack on the Tree of Life synagogue. The uh, first two individuals that were killed, and the first two buried uh, today were two brothers, both 50 years old, and they both were individuals with disabilities. <clears throat> and, um, it seems that this community was attacked because of their commitment to immigrants. They, they have one of the longest histories since the late 1800s of helping uh, initially Jewish people come into the country, but since then, they've expanded their uh, mission to helping immigrants integrate into the country. So this is kind of a question around imagination and how imagination shifts as we begin a practical a process. I'm wondering if you could say just a little more about the, the role of imagination as we engage really tough uh, kinds of things. I think part of what I need to emphasize is that imagination for me is not just like radical, unconnected ideas. So it has to kind of grow out of what we've done in the past and what we know of the past, what we've done so far. But that doesn't mean it's limited or bound or constrained in some way. And so sometimes imagination is trying to do that think outside of the box kind of work of how could things be done differently. And sometimes it's a very methodical march to other countries, to other places. How have you done this? How have you handled migrants? How have you handled um, asylum seekers, et cetera, to find out how others have shaped their stories of immigration? <clears throat> Part of that imagination is pushing boundaries at times. So we know what has happened here in the past, and we know that perhaps we're not satisfied with it in some ways, and perhaps we're very proud of others. Uh, I had this wonderful experience of going to a conference this past April in New York City, and I spent a little time one afternoon breaking away from the conference, and my husband and I went to see uh, Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. Never been there. Wow. I walked out of that museum with a new sense of pride as an American what wonderful hope America offered to so many who arrived at Ellis Island over the years. And I, I stepped away, returning to immigration debates with a whole new perspective on wow, things could be different. Knowing what we have done successfully in the past and what we could do better in the future, it, it was a really um, encouraging moment. And so sometimes imagination has to be supported with those kinds of actions and activities to buoy us, to support us as we kind of continue to try to think differently. That also means not shutting down ideas. We're pretty quick in America to be like, ah, that's not going to work. Move on to the next thing. We already tried that. 
we need to have a little bit more space for allowing ideas to bloom and take hold and try them out before we just push them back off the table. And this idea of imagination is something I was wondering about too, and I wonder <coughs> if the panelists could speak a little bit about how you see in your various disciplines how you can encourage imagination. Because, you know, Wendy, for instance, you were saying that the court has not seemed very imaginative at times. It's gone along with the culture at the time. Um, so how in law or in engineering or in, you know, the, the idea of technology and transportation, how do you encourage students or each other? How do you keep up your hope through imagination? How does that work in your discipline? I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, I think that's a good question. Um, I think as attorneys, we need to do a much better job of this. Um, this is not something that's really talked about much in law school. Imagination, that is not <laughs> something that we address. Um, we, we learn what the laws are and how to argue with people. But I think that um, we need attorneys to do more than just um, write briefs and go to court. We need to think about, you know, is this a good way that we're getting our judges? Is this, do we need to do something different about this? Because we kind of police ourselves. And so um, does our governing body need to do something different? Is it a good thing that judges can take money from the people who are litigating in front of them when they want to run for office? Maybe we should do something about that. That's not really a conversation that you will hear going on between lawyers. So I think as a, a community, we need to take more ownership and responsibility for the legal system and the way that it operates. And so just thinking about the way judges get on the bench is very in my mind right now. But, I mean, that's just one idea. I and mean, there's other things that for a long time, you know, during the civil rights movement, lawyers were involved in that. They were involved in pushing that forward and getting legislation on the floor and supporting people who were, you know, engaged in civil disobedience. And I feel like as a legal community, we've really stepped back from that. And so I think that the conversation needs to start probably in law schools about you know what, how can we think a little bit more creatively about what it means to be a lawyer and our responsibility to the community rather than just representing a person. But we, there's a lot we can do. And um, so I think talks like this are very helpful to just kind of get that conversation going. Well, I can say um, probably that imagination is a, a lot of what we do in that, and in in particularly in the, the program where we are with design. And uh, we're trained to identify problems, identify uh, areas that need improvement, and then create uh, solutions through whatever it is that we're doing. So, um, in my discipline, we'll be doing my for physical products. Um, from a uh, smartphone to a car. Uh, all of our disciplines we do it through um, for communication, etc. But the interesting thing is that we're realizing that it's not enough. Like that's fine to, to find solutions to these projects, but if you start raising the bar, uh, now we start having design thinking, this buzzword you have, and that's the same uh, methodology that we use in design, but to design businesses all these other things, and uh, the latest currents of design are transitioning into the design of government and society. And I, I'm hoping to see as our disciplines grow, uh, where this can be applied to these areas. And the most important thing is it's not composed by designers, it can't be. It needs to be composed by engineers, by attorneys, by educators. It needs to be a multidisciplinary effort there. Um, but it's always this simple methodology. You find something that's wrong, and then you create a solution. It, it may not work the first time, but you learn from your, your first uh, attempt, so you create a second version, and you continue uh, that continuous uh, improvement. I would, I would add that in just like in DAP, engineers are encouraged to imagine because they are to create the things that are not here. Um, they are supposed to take big ideas and make them a reality. So it's interesting because also design thinking is something that we do in engineering. We also couple that with um, engineering design process, which is that iterative nature of making sure that your product will actually be feasible and, and work, but the design thinking piece is a bigger component about making sure you talk to your stakeholders before you design your product 
to make sure those who need it can actually use it and it works for their environment. So I think that imagination coupled with the design thinking also helps with this idea of hope because it brings the, the stakeholders in on your project um, as part of just the methodology. I think in my own practice, I teach an innovative course with partners in DAP. We teach a class called Sticky Innovation, and we introduce the idea of a wicked problem, which ours uh, is colony collapse disorder, hence Sticky Innovation. So <laughs> just a catchy title to, to get students involved, to understand design thinking, human-centered design, arts-based research, engineering design process, and how all of those can work together to solve something like a wicked problem. And a wicked problem truly is, it's not an evil problem, it's just a complex problem, something that has very lots of different solutions, and one solution will cause some unintended consequence, and so how do you actually design in a world that way? In my class this semester has the engineers, um, industrial designers, it's, it's a great space for them to understand how their imagination really will impact the world. I'm smiling as I'm listening to this because this sounds like my dinner table conversation. <laughs> um, my husband's here in the room in the second row, and he's a mechanical engineer, Procter and Gamble, and it's it's bringing all of this together, right? So I'm hearing about what he's doing at work, and is having to think out of the box, thinking to solve some problem or come some product that folks are calling for, and and then I hear the nitty gritty daily, you know, oh, this part of the machine didn't work today. What are we gonna do? And yet, I'm coming to the table, and we're from very different political perspectives. Um, he would identify likely as a libertarian if I put him on the spot right now, or as a <laughs> part of the left at the moment. And so we have these political debates going on, and then I'm saying, okay, you're trying to solve that in, in designing a new product. I'm trying to solve how to make schools better. So I'm turning to, okay, what are my legal precedents I can use to back me, and then when do I need to pro propose policies that are going to push beyond what the courts have supported so far? So it's all of this sort of imaginative work. It's happening at my dinner table, and I think it can happen at dinner tables around the country if we foreground that sort of imaginatory exploration and problem solving together. It's not just something for the business place, but it's something for families and communities to do too. Yes. And by the way, could you hear the two questions before? Should I bring the mic around, or were you able to hear the questions? Okay, I see the yeses. That's what I thought. Awesome. Actually, my question builds off of uh, the conversation that was just happening, and, and you finished with some nice examples about how, as instructors, we can think about bringing these ideas uh, to our students. But I was thinking about in terms of our daily lives, in terms of our work, our institutions, um, and the people who are, aren't in our classes anymore. Do you have some ways to think about just in our daily interactions of how to sort of bring this way of thinking to help us all sort of develop these skills? I'm seeing even in committee meetings, right? And how to uh, moving us in this direction. Um, sometimes it's really simple. Uh, apathy and cynicism are really widespread and rampant right now. And you'll hear them in the smallest of little comments. I mentioned social media in my presentation, like know, the snarky meme about how ineffective government is or what a waste of time it is to take up these kind of efforts, those get shared a bazillion times because they're funny or poignant, but yet they're paralyzing. And so when we let them just circulate amongst our conversations and our way of seeing the world, they're causing stagnation in our society. So simply speaking up against those moments when folks say, eh, that's never going to work, you know, okay, so and so you may be a bit of a curmudgeon about this, maybe you've got to make a little light of it, but let's kind of shift away from that shutting down, that relinquishing of agency and action, and how, what can we do about it? You know, making that call for what can be done, when, even when we're facing our friends and loved ones who might be shutting down um, those views. I think that's a simple, tiny way. Um, looking for examples elsewhere and bringing those examples back to your communities, back to your families to say, hey, you know, have you heard, heard about what the black church has done? You know, let's let me tell you about this history. You know, I'm sitting here taking notes in my head mentally thinking, I better listen to this later because so many of the points you made are really pointed for me to think more about how do we hope better drawing on that rich history in the black church. Those are just small, small examples. Maybe the panelists have others. I was I would say um, ask questions when you see something that 
you disagree with it. It's like, okay, so why am I disagreeing with this? And you give it some <laughs> thought analyze it, and you may realize that you actually don't disagree. You, you, you'll constantly be changing. Um, just that part of inquiry that you that you were mentioning, uh, Sarah. I think that's that's crucial. Like uh, as designers, for example, we're taught to say how to design a chair. Now, from now on, we can never sit in a chair and say like, this chair is perfect because we'll always analyze if their ergonomics are wrong here and there. And I think that's a part of, of everything. If if one person lives life with the knowledge that they have today and they're not open to these new things, it's very difficult to realize. And that's why I think that the worst thing that can happen to a person is to live amongst people that are the same, right? So this otherness will bring his, oh, this person does this other thing differently. Right? I was just a uh, witness in, uh, in Mexico went for a conference, and I would see that we ordered some pizzas for the students for the workshop that I did. And uh, <coughs> students were not taking plates because they were disposable plates. They were cutting the cardboard from the pizza and they were making their own plates. <laughs> so they were more aware than what I was doing now. So now every time I, I will go have pizza, I will find like, questions of should I contribute to this, which I just did. Which, you know, <laughs> I think this comes with the thing will slowly bring it to this, this change. I, I just want to piggyback off of what Sarah said. Um, I think that and I've been thinking about that too. What does this mean for my colleagues? I, I have a pretty good handle on in the classroom how I can start to integrate this, and I'm working on it now with voting, trying to overcome apathy and cynicism. But what does that mean for the, the world at large? And I think that a nice parallel might be, um, if you're a person in the world that has like privilege, like racial privilege, you can spend that privilege by speaking up when people say things that are offensive or think it's funny or don't understand or try to educate. And so if you're, and this is the same kind of thing. You have some information, you have some knowledge, you put some thought into these things. We now have this education and awareness. We can go out into the world and kind of spend this privilege now and say, Apathy and cynicism are easy. That's that's easy. You have to do the hard work now of being a part of the society. And it can be in small ways by not passing on the meme or you know, in larger ways when you hear someone making an offhanded comment instead of letting it go, saying, Well, let's talk about that because this is really important. The future of our democracy depends on it. So it's not okay to be apathetic. That's just taking the easy way out. It's not okay to be cynical. That's that's comfortable, but let's you know work together to do more. And so I think that's a way that all of us, and like you said, committee meetings or wherever we are, can start to try to drive the conversation a little bit more. I would add to you that um, make civil discourse cool again. So <laughs> I say that because we're the ones that hold it back because we're really worried about consequence, about what will, what will happen. But that's also why we do need to learn how to communicate with one another without offense. And I think that we need to be more proactive in having those communications and make it more, we forget that we're people and that we can have general disagreement and still talk civilly about that disagreement. But when you can actually see somebody for the person that they actually are, regardless of what you disagree about, I guarantee you'll find a similarity that you can come to some kind of, oh, this is a collective value. And then it actually helps build that hope that we were just discussing. So I honestly, like, make it some part of your routine. So when someone talks to you, go get coffee and sit down and spend 30 minutes with people. We act like um, talking to each other is labor intensive. It is. <laughs> it really is. But it's also OK and necessary. To jump in on that, I, was, uh, I attended an event down at the convention center recently at the um, Martin Luther King's center sponsored, and a, a big call there was to this kind of civil discourse, and they suggested the simple idea of a, of a civic dinner, and there's an actual civic dinner organization here in the city that encourages folks to round up a group of people, people you don't know well, and have a conversation around food, sit down and talk about what is the hope for society, what are you struggling with, and that's a, it sounds simple, but it's part of that demonstrating this kind of process of building community building or we breaking down those divisions and kind of moving forward, finding that common ground to get us past the, that polarization and difference. Yes, sir. So I agree with all of this. I have a car wall to meet everybody. But what, 
how do you approach this when your own existence is the problem? Mm -hmm. That's my, my biggest question. Oh, that's a powerful way of saying it. Yeah. Um, some of my biggest critics to my health work are um, folks who would identify as black nihilists, for example. So these are folks who are saying, look, we've been hopeful for a long time, and we're tired. Our bodies are worn down. Literally, evidence coming out of health communities shows tired, beaten down black and brown bodies in our communities. It's only hurting us to continue to tell us to keep hoping and to keep trying. Racism is so powerful, white supremacy is so powerful that we need to remove ourselves from those environments, protect ourselves, shore up our own local communities and our experiences within, within them to get by, to find joy and hope within each other and perhaps you know, removing ourselves from interacting across those boundaries of, of race. And there's a point to be had there because when I'm making a call for pragmatist hope, pragmatists determine what's true by what works for us. If it doesn't work for you to keep hoping, then maybe you stop hoping. And that's really pushing me right now to think about how do I respond to those kind of folks who said it's past that point of no return and we can't make things better in the same kind of rose-colored glasses way that I might be proposing. And if that is your body or the body that is being annihilated or raised or attacked that you're in a very different position for experiencing and being told that you have a responsibility to hope and that's why i'm very careful to say hope might not be in our hands it's on our shoulders but we can't expect everyone to shoulder it in the same way and that those who are of power are of privilege actually have more responsibility to heed that collective call to ensuring the well-being of those who do not Thank you for that question. What other questions do you have? What other comments? I just have a personal thing to say. I found it personally very wonderful in this climate. Okay, now uh, I, don't, I don't know if we're hearing that up here, so I'm going to come back. My hope has been <coughs> in this political climate. Um, I have friends, county McDavid, signing up voters. Um, when John Houston and the Supreme Court of Ohio purchase voter rolls, it annihilates and negates everything that they're doing. And I was asked by multiple people to go door to door and try to get people to come to vote. And I professed to you who were signing up to this vote. But when you read headlines like that, like, what's the point? So I came to end on a negative end on a negative vote. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, that's where I've been, like, personally. And um, I've kind of just gone to my whole vote with this. So maybe that's a response. But I think it, it does kind of bring together some of the comments already, and I think there's fear behind that, fear that we won't get beyond this, this hurdle that we're currently facing, fear that the, the next couple things that we try to do just won't work. And I know we, we talked a little bit about, you know, Whitney, you mentioned the white nationalists and, um, and more liberal groups coming together on stage I don't know if that can happen today as easily because I think there is that fear, that fear that we've tried it in the past, it won't work, or things have gotten to such an extreme that we're, we're frightened to try it again. And I, and I wonder about that fear factor, that, that feeling of getting to a point where it's just, we're just fearful we're not going to be able to come back from it. How do you move past that? I mean, I think imagination is part of it, but. But what happens when fear starts shutting down imagination? How do we try to push through that even more to agency? How do, how do we keep that going? I think that one thing that we kind of talk about but gloss over is that high sense of self-efficacy that each individual actually does have to have to make the collective movement work. So I would actually couple self-efficacy with growth mindset um, as well. So you have to know that you can kind of go somewhere and that you have the skills to make a change. I will never lie and say that change is easy. No matter what the change is, it always will be difficult and there will always be some uh, opposition. It, it's just physics, right? So that is that whole science. It, there is always going to be opposition, but you have to know that you can actually make change and that's why storytelling is so important. 
So those who study self-efficacy, especially in the body of like stereotype threat work, and this is just on an individual nature, but I know it can work as a collective as well, they share stories of those who have overcome the same trials and tribulations. For example, other black engineers. I might tell a story of another black engineer so my students know that they, in fact, can graduate from this college, even though that they're, represent they're a minority student. It, those stories of overcoming help build their self-efficacy to know that they can, too, do that. They can, too, persist. And it's the same thing for our society. There's always been opposition, and I wouldn't even say now is more polarized than 1950. I wouldn't say that. I just think it, we're surprised that we're seeing it in 2018. I think that we have told ourselves that we've come so far, and we really didn't. And what was happening in the 50s is happening today. Nothing is new. The weapons might have changed, so maybe it's not necessarily rope, but it's guns. We're seeing this, right? So I think that um, we really need to be honest with ourselves and actually try to get those parties together. I actually do think people can come together and talk because we really talked about the issue instead of talking about publicized hate. And no, I don't blame the media for this. This is real hate. People do harbor it. If we really talked about our true value system, all of us want education for our children. I have done focus groups in churches for the past two months asking church people what do they want for their children. Everyone wants a quality education. It is standard. Everyone wants access to healthy food and resources. You talk about those things that people actually want, then you can actually make collective change. Stop talking about the things that divide us. Talk about the things that make us similar. And I would add to that that um, I think it's important how you define your goals. As a criminal defense attorney, I know something about hopelessness. Um, and sometimes I have to realize walking into a courtroom that I'm not going to win the case. And the, the system is corrupt and it's biased, racially biased. And sometimes I go in there knowing that I'm going to lose. Um, but the best that I can do that day is just to hold space for this person. This person is standing against the government. That's it. That's a win for me. Is they had a person there. And so there's a beautiful story about a man that went to the White House every night during the Vietnam War and held a candle. That was his thing. He showed up with a candle every night, weeks, months. And someone came to him and said, what are you doing with this candle? And he said, you know, do you really think that's going to do anything? Do you really have any hope that's going to change anything? And he said, I'm not trying to change them. I'm here so they don't change me. Mm -hmm. And so I just think it's important that we think about what we're trying to accomplish. And sometimes it's just a little bit, but that's important. Which is also pragmatic, right? You know, we're talking about. So we need to stop thinking about like this big, huge umbrella, far away goal, and start small and make a change where we can. And that that is actually how you make the momentum. That's also how that Rainbow Coalition started. It was just in Chicago with a group of three three different groups. I mean, it's very possible you can get to a bigger goal, but don't be scared to start small. Baby steps. So I would say it is hard to not lose hope in many occasions. Absolutely. Resilience is something very important. And uh, I think everybody will have a moment to to say, I'm done with this, and whatever happens, happens. I don't blame her that. But the other side, and my other side, including my one person, like, that's not going to rest either. So it's just about continuing doing that. Because even though the United States is in a very dire political situation, there is still a lot of places that have had the scars of having that um, dormant society uh, not continue to hope through action, right? So something beautiful about the United States that we will see is that even though things are happening everywhere, people are out there protesting. And there's, it's, it's out there, it's, it's discussion, TVs everywhere, and it's quiet in other places. So uh, just don't let it go by. Some of the things I've said today, I think sound very like grand and wonderful. Where are they actually happening? So I think sometimes we need to highlight moments when they're happening because they are happening every day. So yesterday, here's my most recent example I can give you. Yesterday afternoon, 
a Greyhound bus full of folks arrived from Chicago. They were um, a part of a group called Journey for Justice, led by a man named G2 Brown. They are fighting for quality schools in poor black and brown communities, mostly on the south side of Chicago. They arrived here in Cincinnati looking for hope. They had heard that even though you might quickly hear Cincinnati Public Schools getting Ds and Fs on its public report card, you might not know that we're one of the leading urban public education districts in the country. Folks come here to find out how we provide wraparound services, to provide resources, to provide an array of services that our students need to succeed in Cincinnati. So this bus load shows up. We take them into two of our local schools here in Cincinnati to show them how we are educating in ways that are working. Afterward, we gather for a press conference, a public space to share our frustrations about poor schools in Chicago, to talk about the numbers of schools being closed down, to talk about democratic restrictions. So in Chicago, they have an appointed school board. Folks are feeling that they don't have any checks and balances for the folks who are making decisions about the schools. They share this publicly, WLWT, other stations are there listening and reporting out the frustrations of these folks from Chicago. And then we hear visions of how it can be different. A parent here in Cincinnati whose child had um, autism and some other significant intellectual and physical disabilities talked about the services that she received here in Cincinnati because she talked about her anger, her disappointment at what had been provided, and her ability to create change within our system. We heard from a Syrian refugee who talked about coming here to the United States seeking a better life, enrolling herself at age 20 in Aiken High School to find out more about how American democracy works and how to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. After the press left, you know what we did? We told stories. How did it get started here in Cincinnati? What's not going well still here in Cincinnati? What do we need to change? Folks from Chicago were asking us, how do we get an elected school board? How do we get a local school decision-making committee who can be involved in shaping the policies and practices of their schools? We shared what's worked. We talked about what needs to happen. We left as a we. Um, you know, at one point, one of the women here from Cincinnati said to the Chicago folks, you know, if you're ever in town, stop in. You're welcome to stay. And, G2 Brown responded to her as leader, and he said, well, of course, now we're family. And I left thinking about what that meant, that spirit of me that was created in that space, and I came home to my husband, and I said, you know, I sat today with two African-American eighth graders living on the south side of Chicago who had never been outside of Chicago. And so when we served La Rosa's pizza for lunch, they looked at me like, what is this? <laughs> and we had this conversation. I said, I know, I love Blue Mile Audis too, but we don't have that here. And the, and the young man, what? We don't have that here. So we're having these basic conversations about life outside of Chicago. And he's asking me about what is life like here in Cincinnati? I mean, physically, what do you have? What are kids like? What is What opportunities are here? How do you get to college here? And I came home and I said, what an amazing experience that I have today interacting with someone who I might not otherwise have any reason or occasion to interact with. And we left becoming the we around hoping for quality schools in Chicago, in Cincinnati, and across the country. These happen every day. You've got to find them and get involved in them and take action in them. I promise that we end on a positive note. And I think that's a very positive note. So first of all, let's give a round of applause. I like the fact that Sarah ended, and our presenters as well, with this idea of we. And I do appreciate that we all came here together. Um, you know, with some of the comments that were made, I appreciate that a lot of us are feeling tired. <laughs> And um, we do need a break, and I think that's part of what we need to do for each other, is allow those breaks, allow you know, my colleague to take a break while I take up the, the banner, and then when I need a break, somebody else takes up the banner. And I think being here together makes me feel that working together, we can move ahead while we also have some time to catch our breaths and heal ourselves a little bit from the wounds that we're feeling. So I do want to, to wrap up um, this presentation of Life of the Mind. 
Thank you again to Sarah Stitzline and our panelists, Wendy Calloway, Whitney Gaskins, and Antonio Islas Munoz for their excellent presentations and remarks. And to you, the audience, for being willing to share your concerns and listen and engage with this topic. Thank you again to everyone who made this possible, including the support from the presidents and the provost offices, as Sarah had mentioned, and again, the behind the scenes work of Melissa Cox Norris. We appreciate your, you joining us, and if you want to relive today's experience, <laughs> or share this with colleagues or students, and you're, you should feel free to do that. The lecture and the, and the conversation was taped, and it will be available at the library's website, very easy website to remember, www.libraries.uc.edu. Thank you very much for coming today. <laughs>